of Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations. I am so glad you decided to join us. Check out our program, check out our viral worship, check out our church in general. There are a lot of great things happening at Shiloh. Please go to our website and see some of the great activities that we are doing here uh, in our area. Some of the things that we are doing to reach people for Christ. We are a kingdom church who believes in kingdom building, who is helping to change people's lives. Check out the message today. Go to our website. Check out our other messages. We are so glad to make you a friend of Shiloh Baptist Church. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a blessed day.
teach in the book of Job. But I have an interesting message that God wants to give you this morning. I know somebody out there needs this today. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. When you have it, say amen. All right, so let's start reading in Job chapter 1 at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also was among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and does not turn to evil? Has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he had on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth your hand now, and touch all that he had, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. We have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you today that your anointing has already breathed on this word. Uh, gather your people's thoughts and their minds, Lord, to let them know that a powerful thought is about to go into their heart, Lord, in some kind of way. Allow this to be received. Don't let my mess get in the way of your blessing, God. I thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, we're going to speak from the thought, stay strong without your hedge. I'll say it one more time. Stay strong without your your hedge. There is a great legacy and an irreversible promise from God that he will protect us, he will provide for us, and he will guide our lives. Somebody said, I know that's right, Pastor, because I couldn't have been where I am now. God had not protected me, he had not provided for me, he had not guided me. Every believer needs to know that God's assurance is better than any insurance that you can get on this side. Meaning it can't be revoked, it can't be canceled, you can't be kicked off. God's policy is signed in blood. I like that. It is a policy that is based on God's unconditional love for us and on the unfinished work or the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross. And I need you to know that every time we get delivered, it is a visual reminder that God is our protector. If you will, God has placed a hedge around us. Some of us would have been gone. Some of us would have went down if God hadn't had a hedge of protection all around us. Every believer I know can tell me that there are many, many times you look back over your life and you remember that it was God because you can see the work that God was doing in your life. So God protects us. And I need you to know, having a hedge of protection, like the old folk used to say, is a scriptural promise. It's not something we just made up. God has put a hedge over us, and if God wasn't protecting us, no telling where we would be. Let's look at that. First of all, the Bible lets us know God protects us. How do you know, Pastor? All you got to do is go with me to Exodus chapter 14. The children of Israel are on their way to the promised land. You remember that God had delivered them out of bondage? and set them free. I need you to know that every time God gets ready to start a protection plan, it's always after he delivers you. So we can remember that when we get delivered by God, we do not go back into bondage. Somebody just got that. But see the children of Israel. They're going through the desert. All millions of them walking away. They just got set free by God. And then the Bible tells us that they were trapped in the desert. Well, were they? But they were trapped in the desert. It said that there was mountains on each side. The Red Sea in front of them, and Pharaoh was coming hard from behind them. Now watch this. I had to check this out because I was always interested why the Bible said in verse 5 of Exodus chapter 14, I was interested why it said that God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. That means God is the 
the one who hired Pharaoh to go after his people. Let me tell you why. I looked it up, and here's the exact terminology of what God said. He said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that I can get my honor on Pharaoh and all of his hosts. Watch this. So they will know I'm Jehovah. He was not just trying to get his revenge on Pharaoh. He was actually giving other generations of Egyptians who saw those miracles God did. He was giving them an opportunity to know, wow, he must have been God. But here is the protection. As Pharaoh got closer, the Red Sea in front, God actually put up a wall of fire so that while he was making the Red Sea or dividing the Red Sea, he had a wall of fire to stop Pharaoh from coming any closer. Can you imagine God having that uh, that? Wall of fire, Pharaoh with his chariots trying to get through. And there was Jesus, there was God allowing his children to go through the Red Sea. So God protects us or keeps us safe even when somebody's on our track. Somebody need to rejoice right there because there's been some demons on your track. And God put up a wall. They couldn't reach you while you were sleeping. They couldn't reach you on your job. They couldn't touch your body any longer. So I need you to know that God puts up a protection if it was up to the enemy, we would have gone under a long time ago. Not only does God protect us, he provides for us. I like this. When David was leaving and Solomon was actually going for his crowning and taking over the throne, it tells us in 2 Chronicles 29, 11 and 12, it says that David was telling everyone, I want you to continue to build the temple, follow Solomon, contribute to the temple. But watch this. He also said... When you start thinking about how good God has been, and David was about to leave here, I believe an overwhelming spirit hit David, and David said this word. This, i got to read this because I don't want to mess this up. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11 and 12. Oh Lord, you are great, mighty, majestic, magnificent, glorious, and sovereign over all the earth. You, Lord, have dominion and exalt yourself as the ruler of all. You are the source of wealth and honor. You rule over all your people. You rule over all. You possess strength and might to magnify and give strength to all. Did you see it? Here's what God is saying. When I provide for you, sometimes we want to talk about stuff. God just does not provide stuff. He provides everything David said we should laugh, we should rejoice about. What did he say? God provides strength. He provides us with the things that we need when we need it. He gives us honor. He gives us wealth. Everything you have, God gave you because God said, I got a head of protection around you that says I will also provide for you. And the last thing is, God not only provides for us uh, when he gives us strength, and God not only provides for us, God not only protects us, but God guides us. Here's something I didn't take a lot of stock in until I started looking at my life. Do you know your life has some twists and turns that you don't know how you got where you are? But aren't you glad there was somebody else in charge of your life that was guiding your life and taking you where you are? Come on. You and I know there's no way we should be where we are, have what we have, but God decided that I'm going to guide you. I like Psalms 107, verse 6. Watch this. It says, Then they cried unto the Lord. In their trouble, he delivered them from all their fears. But well, verse 7 says, and he led them forth the right way. There it is. God said, you've been trying to go the wrong way, but because you belong to me, I protect you and guide you the right way. Then verse 8 says something that we've been crying for years. I've been telling folks you ought to do this while you have breath in your body. The psalmist said, all that men might praise the Lord for his goodness to men and his wonderful works to the children of men. So there is no doubt that there is a hedge of protection. The Bible just showed us, Moses just showed us, David just showed us, the psalmist just showed us. But also there is a correspondingly, there's a time when God allows our hedge to be removed. I wanted to talk about this because in the book of Job, nobody ever talks about how do I make it when my hedge is down? Many a person has been scarred when their hedge was down. When God removed the hedge, you've been listening to all the prosperity preachers. Must be something wrong with me. I don't have no neighbor to claim it. I can't get my stuff. But did you know that some of our strongest times is when God takes the hedge down so we can actually see the movie of our life that he has created? Do you know when God takes the hedge 
down. He's still writing our story, but then he puts the pencil in our hand and says, come on, write like you still love me, like you still belong to me, like you still believe in me. So what happens is God takes the hedge of protection down. Now I need you to understand this. I didn't say this. The Bible said it. I read it to you. I'm going to teach it. There was a point in Job's life when all Job had done, God allowed his hedge to come down. And Job is going to be a witness that even without my head, I can see strong. I can stay strong. I know you're glad you signed in here this morning. I know you're glad you tuned in to get this word. I'm going to teach you what Job taught us through this word, how to stay strong even without your head. What do I mean by your head's coming down? Let's explain it biblically so I don't get anybody that don't understand theologically what I'm talking about. When God takes your head down, I mean God allows us to go through things that are going to bring us into the area that he wants us to have. What do I mean? God said, I created you to be this. So everything I let you go through, don't miss this, contributes to you becoming the warrior and the soldier and the servant that God created you to be. If you didn't go through anything, so he makes sure that you go through enough trials. Can I tell you something? How in the world you going to tell me God can keep you if you never went through anything where God kept you? Only people can tell whether God can keep you are those that have gone through it. That's what makes you the warrior. That's what makes you the soldier. That's what makes you stronger. What am I talking about? When you understand that God takes us through for our good and not his, we become blessed. Because if you ever had a sleepless night and God woke you up all right, if you ever went through a period where your money was funny, but God kept you fine anyhow, if you ever had a time where you had demon after demon on your track, but you got on your knees and began to pray and an anointing came over you that could not be described, you know it, other folk don't know it, but if you let them in on your secret, there were times you were going down, but God was strong enough to keep us. Listen, everything God does is to contribute to our eternal destination. Don't forget that. Everything God does, we look for the moment. God looks down eternity, and he said, I got to take you through that so you'll be ready for your eternity. And what God does with our eternity is he lets us know that I strengthen you by taking your heads down, according to this book in Job, and I'm going to teach on those, but I need you to write this down. Three reasons God takes your heads down. You'd be surprised. The first reason God removes our head is so we can grow. Some of you have gotten comfortable. You've gotten satisfied. God needs you over here, but you're so busy being satisfied and lapping up all you have here that you forgot God's got to put you in a situation where you're going to pray. He's going to put you in a situation where you're going to get closer. So the first reason God removes our head so he can grow us. Some of us don't want to grow any further. I serve the Lord with all I have. God said, no, that's not where you're supposed to stop. i got great things in your life. So the first reason God does is he wants to grow us. The second reason that God allows our heads to be taken away, watch this, is because he wants to test us. What do I mean? God said, I need to let you know that you're stronger than you think you are. I like God because God said the test is not for me. I'm not that kind of God. I don't do anything that's going to hurt you. He said the test I provide is for you. And if your faith don't give out, you'll pass that test with flying covers. So God said I take the hedge away so I can grow. I take the hedge away so I can test you. Follow me. Every good child of God has been tested. If you've been tested, yes, I know if you could talk back to me, you would tell me, heck yeah, I've been tested because tests come along with this walk in life. And the third reason is probably the most prevalent reason God allows our heads to be taken. James Hollis, Professor James Hollis, in his book, Why Good People Do Bad Things. I'm going to get to the other part there, but I need you to hear this. Why Good People Do Bad Things. James Hollis wrote this book in the late 80s. You know what he said? He said, everybody needs to understand they got a dark nature. There's a dark side to us. And if we could do some confessing up in this piece now, some of us will tell you, I am shocked that some of the dark things that I can think in my mind, are you with me? Some of the dark things that I have done in my life, I'm saved, but some of the dark stuff, what God says is, I don't only have to take you and grow you, 
I don't only have to test you. In some cases, you're not going to get rid of that darkness, rid of that sin nature, rid of that thing you like until I break you. Sometimes God takes the heads down to break us before we kill ourselves, to break us before we mess up our lives. To break us so we remember where our help comes from. So God said those are the three reasons God actually takes down our head. What are they again? He does it to grow us. He does it to test us. And he does it to break us. That brings us to Mr. Job. Job is a great example of how to exist under pressure and stay strong enough to worship God. We got too many wimps in the body of Christ that when trouble comes, oh, you're good when you shout. You're good when everything is good. But can you stay strong once God removes that hedge and expects you to move out on what you know? Can you write this down? Here's what we're talking about. You need to have an audacious spirit you're going to conquer in the middle of your trial. What does what is audacity mean? Audacity is defined as somebody who's willing to make a bold move. When you're audacious, it means that you do it because it may not be easy. It may not be what someone else thinks I should do. But I do it because I'm making a bold move because I'm reaching for what I want. God says it's audacious to be in the middle of all hell working loose and you decide I'm going to stay strong anyhow because audacity says I am bold, I am daring, and I believe my God can keep me. Somebody just say audacity. You ought to have an audacious spirit. That's going to be our three points today. Write them down. Very easy since I gave you the definition of audacity. Here it is. You need an audacious faith to make it when your head is down, when the head is gone. You need an audacious faith. You need, I'm just telling you where I'm going, so you stay with me. You need to have audacious trust. You need an audacious faith when the hedge is gone. That's right. I see some of you, you got it. You need an audacious trust when your hedge is gone. And you need to get ready for an audacious blessing once you survive. Let's look at this. This book of Job has raised a lot of questions in the past. The biggest question, I just told you about James Hollis and his book, uh, Why Good People Do Bad Things. That doesn't fascinate us, but there's a whole school of thought out there as to why bad things happen to good people. My church will tell you what I always tell them. What in the world, who in the world told you you were good? But I'm not messing with that today. I'm going to act like you're good for the sake of where we're going because we're not looking at that because there is a whole Christian school of thought trying to understand this big question of why bad things happen to good people and why God allows good people to suffer or why God allows somebody like Job who was a prayer to go through. Here's what the Bible tells us, that we, there is a, a doctrine or a Christian school of theology called theodicy. Everybody say that, theodicy. And you've heard it before because we've taught it before. But a theodicy is actually defined as I am, it's, it's our way of uh, explaining how an omnipotent, sovereign God can allow evil to be in the world and not be responsible for the evil. you got to understand the theodicy. What can I tell you? It's made up of two Greek words. The word theos, which means God, and the word dike, which means justice. Here's what it's saying. It, we're trying to explain why God is still just even though they're suffering in the world. The word actually means justifying God. So the big questions in Job are, here are the questions that Job wants answered, and when his three or four friends, if you want to call them friends, come along, they say to Job, is God just? Is God running your universe justly? Is God responsible for evil? But well, we're going to find that out. See, the book is structured like this. It's, it's a purposeful structure. There is a prelogue that actually has an explanation where we meet Job and his character. He's an upright man. He's a good man. It shows everything good about Job. He excuses evil. That's a good old King James word. He excuses evil. And it says Job was righteous before God better than any other man in the East. And yet, after God talks about Job and all he has, the scene shifts 
up to heaven and we see God standing with the angels coming to God and Satan is there too. We see Satan. Now, Satan now means accuser. He used to be Lucifer, which means son of the morning. But now he is the accuser. So he's doing what he named is. He was coming to accuse the brother. Can you see it? All the angels came. Satan had been kicked out. Here comes Satan to want to be with the angels just so he could accuse somebody. And God right there is when God said, have you considered my servant Job? Now I need you to understand something is that when Job's four friends show up, uh, the, so the book is a prelogue that talks about Job in heaven. Then there is some Hebrew poetry in the middle. And then there's a place where God comes down and talks to Job. Then there's an end where there's an epilogue which concludes all of Job, Job's journey. So let's look at our first point. Are y'all still with me? Stay with my first point. The first point is you need an audacious faith. Here's what had happened. When they left heaven, now watch what God did. Satan is walking around heaven. I couldn't understand this for a long time. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Let's talk about it. Job is going to show us in the text that he had an audacious faith after what happened. you got to have a little background. Here's what's going on. Job's friends, when they came and they started accusing Job, it's because the standard thought about God, theology in that time was, he's a good God. If you do good things, it will equal a good life. So Job's friends came to him, and that's why they were accusing him. They said, Job, no matter what you say, he's a good God. You must have done some bad things, and that's why you're having a bad life. Here's where Job's faith came in. Job said, uh-uh, he is a good God, but I'm a good Christian. I don't know what's going on. Oh, here's a shot. But I'm going to hold on to God anyhow. Anybody ever been there where the bottom was falling out? But you said, I'm going to hold on to God anyhow. Here's what Job said. You have to say what you want. All I know is, I don't know what's going on, but I'm trust. I have faith to believe my God is able to get me out. I believe my God. I believe my God is going to deliver me. He believed that his salvation was not for a moment. God did not bring me, as the folks said, this far to leave me out. I'm talking to somebody right here. God did not bring you so you could turn sour and drop your praise down. God did not bring you so you could get arrogant in his face now. God said, I brought you this far so you could grow and be better than you are right now. When you got saved, there was a blessing in your life. See, when I talk about audacious faith, I don't have to give you a whole lot of explanations. Here's what audacious faith is. You took your little drunk, prostituting, fornicating, Cussing, lying, cheating, fighting self, some kind of way the word of God broke into your heart, follow me, and you had a nerve, you had your audacity, once you got touched by God, to say, I am saved. You knew you were no good. But how many of y'all know one touch from God can turn things around? It'll make you run around with audacious faith saying, I'm saved. How in the world you were just drinking, child? What, 10 minutes ago you came out of the bar? I just saw you throw that joint away. How you tell you saved? Because once that spirit of God comes in your heart, you get audacious and you start saying, I am saved no matter what you say. Old folks said, I looked at my hands, my hands look new. Looked at my feet, they did too. You start saying, I don't do what I used to, all that kind of stuff. Because once we get saved, we get audacious in our faith. But that's not all of the audacity. Here's the part that I've seen. Here's what's really audacious to me. is when you got saved, you came to God for fornicating and drinking and drugging and doing what you were doing. Now you're saved. And since you've been saved, you still drink. Slip, right? You still drug. You still cuss folk out. You still will fight yourself. You've done all that stuff. But let somebody walk up to you and tell you, even since you've been saved, what are you doing? You're not saved. Man, you look them in the eye. I don't know who you're talking to. I'm saved. That's audacious faith. Because audacious faith says, I may not be who I should be, but I have seen God's mercy. Man, you're looking at the outside. God looks at my heart. And all I know is, since I found God, there's a change in my life. And I'm not who I used to be. Because audacious faith says, I'm going to hold on 
no matter how long it takes. What am I talking about? Hebrews 11, 6 says this. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he is. He's a rewarder of those that are diligently seek him. I can give you all kind of verses about faith, but I like 1 Corinthians 2 and 5. That your faith might stand not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So all I'm saying is you need to keep doing what you're doing. How could Job say that I got all this faith when all this stuff was happening in his life? All I need you to know is faith, real faith trusts God. If you look at the verse, he got to the point where he knew that God didn't choose him so he could fail. What am I talking about? When uh, my son was younger, I remember trying to teach my son to ride a bike without training wheels. Because if you look at the text, the text says, God went to Satan and said, have you considered my servant Job? So, the first reason you ought to have audacious faith is because God is the one who trusts you to get through the trial. God wouldn't put you out there with as much as he loved you if he didn't know you were going to get through. God trusts you so much that, you know, somebody told me, the book of Job, God made a bet with Satan. You didn't see anything in the scripture about a bet. If God was betting, he was betting on a sure thing because by the time he got to this discourse with Satan, he said, have you considered my servant, Job? That means God trusts you. I want to give somebody news. God trusts you enough to know you can do it even though you don't know you can do it. What am I talking about? When Justin was learning to ride without, I remember the day, I took him outside and I said, today, son, I'm going to teach you how to ride without your training wheels. He said, no, Dad, don't take your training wheels off. I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. I looked at him and said, I'm going to be right there with you. Don't you worry. All you got to do is trust me. All you got to do is have faith. Daddy's going to be there. So all of a sudden, I said, I'm going to be there. So we were riding down. I took the training wheels off. I pushed him a little bit. Let him go a little bit. He fell. Got back up. He said, Dad, Dad. And I was ready. I said, I'm right here. I know you can do this. I kept saying, I know you can do this. And pretty soon I was running. And he started looking at me instead of worrying about the fear. And when he started putting his eyes on me, he started riding. And I'll never forget the first time he turned around and said, Dad, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And I hollered back at him. I knew you could. You know why some of you are going to get through this trial? Because right when you get ready to give up, God is going to look at you and say, I knew you could. All you had to do was keep your eye on me. Audacious faith also comes from verse 9. Look at it. Does God, Satan said, okay, cool, but does God, does Job fear God for nothing? Here's what he said. He said, you've given him a hedge, you, put, you blessed his house, you gave him everything, so take down that stuff and he will curse you. But listen to verse 9. Here's some reason that you should have faith when your hedge is gone. He said, Satan even recognized, God has blessed you. Can I tell somebody something? God blessed you. To get to where you are because you have favor on, I'm going to stop. Come on, you know you got favor on your life. You know there's some things you should have gone down for. You know there's some times God favored you over other people. You know there's some things God has given you that you did not deserve. You were at the brink of death or you were at a point of suicide or you were at a point of, I can't go on. I don't know what it was, but you got to the point. Didn't God change your life and bless you? Here's what makes you stand when your head to go down. You always say, I'm blessed. I gotta realize that I am blessed already. Most of us don't realize and celebrate the blessings that we already have. Watch this, you gotta realize a lady's husband was going for heart surgery. Well, and it was a 50-50 chance that he might not make it. But while he was in the surgery, a letter came to the house that said, watch this, he just won a million dollars. So she said, well, the pastor's going to the hospital later and he's going to pray for him. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to let the pastor tell him. A oh, pastor, you got to break it to him gently because you know he just had heart surgery. So they went in there and the pastor looked at the man and said, uh, Joe, uh, what would you do if you just won a million dollars? And Joe said, well, I give it to you in the church. The pastor dropped dead of a heart attack right there. The pastor wasn't ready for the blessing that he was going to get from the man. I'm doing that and, and I'm joking about that because you need to understand something. Sometimes you sit around and tell God, uh, you complain about your car because it's not a new car, but you forget you got a car. Sometimes you sit in your house 
and you complain about your furniture. Look at this furniture. It ain't new furniture, but thank God you got somewhere to sit. Sometimes you complain about stuff. You complain, I got a health condition. Why can't I be like everybody else? What you should be celebrating is the fact that you have medication that can keep your health condition. And all I'm telling you is that you got to understand that when God blesses you, you ought to celebrate the blessings that you had. No more jokes, but watch this. There was a woman, this is a true story, I was counseling her, she lost her husband. And she got to the point, it was the anniversary, or her husband's birthday, and she got to the point where she could not handle it. Got to the point where it was messing with her. You know, it's so funny, because I'm going through situations over the loss of my father, where I dealt with the same thing. But this, this lady had lost her husband. I want you to see this. She went into a room and she was telling God that I don't think I can make it, God. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how I got into this situation. So her children came over, you know, and they were trying to encourage her, but she went back in the bedroom. Just when she was at her lowest point, her little granddaughter walked by and went into the room. When her granddaughter got into the room, she said, she started, she started crying. The granddaughter started crying. And the mom said, well, why, honey, why are you crying? And the granddaughter looked and said, Mama, um, I know you're sad, but you still got me. And the woman grabbed the little, her granddaughter and hugged her and said, honey, I know, I know. But watch this. She didn't know. When the little girl left, she had a different praise for God. She looked up to God and said, God, sometimes I am so caught in what I lost, I forget to celebrate what I had. And lastly, the reason you should have audacious faith is because, watch that last line in verse 12. It's when the Lord said to Satan, you can do what you want to him, just don't lay a finger on him, just don't hurt him. So, watch this. So, I want you to know another reason you should have audacious faith is because God limits your trials. May not mean nothing to you right now, but there's some moments when your trial would have took you out, but God limited your trial so the enemy could not keep you. God made sure that the devil could only go so far, and then he had to come back. There's a poem that I know you all know, but I want to read it here because it fits in my message, and I used to love it when I was, a, when I was first saved, but it's called Footprints. And if you know it, you enjoy it, just listening to it with me. One night I dreamed a dream as I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the dark sky flash scenes from my life. Each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me and one belonged to the Lord. I, I know this, so let me just tell it to you. And then I, the last scene of my life, I was able to reflect back. And I said, I looked around and the worst times in my life, instead of two sets of footprints, there was only one. This troubled me. I mean, the saddest and lowest times in my life, I start thinking, where was God? So he noticed that, and so he prayed to God and said, Lord, I don't understand. The worst times, the saddest times, where were you? I noticed I saw two sets of footprints in two of those times. And God whispered and said, my precious child, I love you so much, and I will never leave you, never ever doing your trials. He said, when you saw one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Isn't that what God told Paul? My grace is sufficient for your trial. Let's move on. I got to close. Watch this. So we found out at the end of this chapter, Job, towards, after all of the, when Satan left God, the tragedy happened to his children. His sheep were gone. His cattle was gone. His uh, camels were gone. Then his children died. Job tore his robe, shaved his head, and sat there. The Bible said, but he fell down. Look at the text. I, I thought I was missing this. He worshipped. Even in the middle of everything falling apart, he worshipped. You want to get some good news out of this message? Learn to worship in your worst days. He said, the Lord gave, the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then that chapter ended with Job being blessed. And so we find out that this time, Satan wasn't satisfied. Chapter 2 starts with God. Again came to Satan and they walked up there. You know, the angels came, sons of God. Here comes Satan again. And God said again, I couldn't believe this, because that chapter, Job ended with Job did not sin. He blessed God. 
But then it said, God said, have you considered my, my servant Job? Um, you tried to turn him against me, but he still kept his integrity. And Satan had a nerve to say, yes, but skin for skin will all men give for his own help. And God said, all right, go out and you can touch his flesh, but don't kill him. Satan went out immediately and put boils on, on Job. Can you imagine now Job? who thought the worst was over. It takes me to the second point, but this is, you need to have audacious trust. Trust is, can I trust in the faith that I put in God? Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. When something starts happening over and over again, it shakes your trust. I know God is faithful, but can I trust Him? Can I trust you, God, with the way I'm feeling? You need to understand something. That God says, when all hell breaks loose, God said, have you considered my servant Job? I thought about that thing, and it hit me back with a proverb. If you want something done, find a busy person. And that's all God was doing. God was saying, if you want somebody that's going to praise me, when all hell breaks loose, find me somebody who already been through hell and praised me anyhow. Job had already been through hell. God said, I believe I can trust Job to go further. You know there's somebody out there right now, I'm never going under. I'm never giving up. I'm never going to stop. You know why? Because you believe the fact that because God has been good, I'm not going to let go. And this text will let you know why you should do that. Here's what I need you to know. A true servant gets tested more because they are a true servant. God chooses us because he knows we will stand the test. That gives me honor. I mean, I don't like the fact that I'm chosen, but it must mean I'm a bad somebody. It must mean there's some demons in hell scared me. God said, get it. Have you considered him? I believe if God said that, some demons start shaking and saying, man, the last time I touched her, she was on a fast. The last time I touched him, he began to pray. The last time I touched him, he started reading his Bible. So I know when God said you considered them, you didn't realize God chose you to go through hell because you are true. He only truth chooses true people to deal with true tests. Not only that, watch this. He said, don't kill. I love this. God says, I'm going to take you to a point. And you know, none of us want to confess this. We don't ever want to confess to anybody that we were almost at the point of suicide, we were crazy, or we were going under. But all of us have mental breakdowns. Come on, be honest with me right now. Man, since this COVID's going on, I've had some mental moments. And there's been some struggles in my life. I may look like I'm up here preaching, everything's okay. But I've had times when there, when there was demon on top of demon, darkness on top of darkness, trouble on top of trouble. All I could do was pray to hold the line. But here's what happens. Not only does he test you because you're true, he gives you a deeper walk for more power because he shows you things that you can't see until you're in the trial. Wow. What are you talking about, Pastor? Watch this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew God would come in the fire because they went in the fire. You won't know God is a God who can help you in fire Unless he takes you in the fire. Oh, man, that's good. Listen, he puts you in the fire so you can see he's a God of fire. So the next time fire comes, you're not worried about the fire. Not only that, God shows you that he is a God that, since I know he's in the fire, I won't be afraid of my trial and I won't bow down every time the enemy comes. God said, I've shown you this. He said, I can't show you that I can heal issues of blood until after, well, it might take me 12 years to show you. I can't show you that I can perform an exorcism like the woman that was bowed down 18 years by Satan. I can't show you that I can perform an exorcism to get that long-term demon out of your life until after you've been bowed down 18 years. You may not want to be bowed down, but the longer you're bowed down, the more power you're going to see. You will see what other people do not see. It's right there. You'll see the fire. I love the fact that God told Moses, I can't show nobody my glory. He said, well, Moses, since you trusted me and sought me, I'm going to walk by, hide you in the cleft of the rocks, and you'll see my rear end as it goes by. He said, I'm going to show you some of my glory. And just, what am I trying to say? People who go through struggle 
See the glory of God. Has anybody out there seen the glory of God? The glory of God shows up in midnight hours. That's the glory of God. Let me close. Naomi with her empty womb would have never had a child if she didn't trust God. The last thing you need to understand is once you accept good and bad, watch what happened. Job's wife came to him. And when Job's wife came to him, she said, aren't you going to curse your God and die now? Come on, come closer, come closer, come closer. He said, aren't you going to trust your God and die now? And Job said, woman, you must be crazy. Am I only to accept good from God and not bad? And it says, and I love the verse, it says, in all of this, Job did not sin with his mouth. Now, you know, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So let's go to the last point. Follow me. Here's where we are. First, you need audacious faith. Second, you need audacious trust. I'm closing right now. You need audacious trust. And we're at the end of chapter 2. But to get to our last point, audacious faith will keep your head, keep you when the hedge is gone. Audacious trust will keep you when the hedge is gone. But the final point is, you need to get ready for audacious blessings. What am I saying? You got to go to Job 42 and 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. That word turn means that God actually reversed the situation. He took his trust. He took his faith. He lifted him higher, and Job became the head and not the tail. I know somebody's waking up now. You're going through something right now, God's going to turn your captivity because you are in the middle. You know what? Your head has been down. You've been going through struggles. Everybody's been acting like they don't know what's going on. Remember when Job White came to him? Other people have been trying to act like they know what's going on. All I'm telling you is don't listen to other people. Listen to me. What God has for you is for you. So when you stand, God will turn your captivity. I know I got a witness out there, and there were times when God turned my situation around. When he turned it around, I found out I had what the next thing is in this text. It says God turned Job's situation. Then Job had twice as much. Once you have your heads down and you stand strong, God said, I will also give you more. And God turns you around. He gives you more. All I'm telling you is when you have audacious faith, you get blessed. Look at the text. It says, his brothers and sisters came to Job's house and God gave him the end. I'm ready now. God gave him the blessing because he got back twice as many sheep Got his family back, twice as many camel, twice as many donkeys. Then he got more sons and daughters. All I'm telling you is, if you stay strong, when your hedge is down, and God will remove that hedge. I didn't say he'd leave you. I didn't say he'd stop loving you. I didn't say he wouldn't be with you. I just said when the hedge is down, you need to learn to trust God. This message is for somebody out there. It's a powerful point. Many times when we're talking about Job, everybody wants to talk about his suffering. Can we talk about his strength? Can we talk about some of you out there know, Pastor, you just hit me. There are some days when I have gone through some stuff and I know I didn't have the heads, but I had my faith. I had my trust. And now, I got the blessing. This Pastor Duncan saying, look, tune in. Send this message out to somebody on the rebroadcast. Let them know the blessing that we'll get from this message. I'm going to tell you some great things about our ministry as I close tonight. First thing is I want every head bowed and every eye closed. I never take for granted that everybody knows the Lord. This is a message where you can... Feel that fire we talked about. I've been changed. Here it is. Repeat these words after me. 
I was just the same God that kept you is going to keep you. Come on, come on. You got nothing to lose. Say this. Say, Lord God, I'm glad that it wasn't too late. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins because you died and rose again with all power in your hand. Say this, it's the rejoicing. I am saved. You did it! If you prayed that prayer, you just became born again and blessed of God. Please go to our website, Shiloh Baptist Churches, www.shilohbaptistchurches.org and you will find a place where if you say, I want to be a virtual member, we'll accept you, we'll bless you, we'll send you up. Stay with us. God is blessing and doing some work in this ministry. And you know what you see, Shiloh? What you see is what you get. We don't put on, we are doing the best we can to make God proud of the kingdom work that we're doing here. Tune in, you'll see some of the great things that's happening for every level. I don't have time to go into that now. But please, if you want to give, go to our website. There's a place where you can give. Everything you give goes outside our walls at our CDC so we can make sure our church is fulfilling what God will. Thank you again, all of you who tuned in. I don't take for granted that you come and listen. Spread the word. Tell somebody else about Shiloh. Let them know that we're here to bless them. I thank you now. Again, have a great day. I was down but with no way up and I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living just existing Well and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free What he did.